morning. So good to see you today, and I am glad to be here. Uh, I know my number one qualification for speaking today, it happens to be my age. Uh, he's told me that three times, so I got it, preacher. <laughs> But it's good to be here, and I don't know about you seniors, it's good to have gotten this far. There are many that have not made it. Uh, somebody passed me something this morning, and uh, it said, I was taught to respect my elders. It's just getting harder and harder to find any of them. <laughs> there, there are not many older, are they? Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to uh, share with you today. Uh, God has been good to me in my life, and I want to share some thoughts and about life. You know, we think about life and we live our life. And uh, I didn't want to just talk to the seniors because I think that if you had an opportunity, you would want to say something to these young people about their life and about what they need to learn and things that they need to do. So I want to kind of do one of these panoramic views, and we're going to start with the younger. Then we're going to kind of work to the middle age, and then we'll get to the seniors in just a little bit, okay? i got a verse I want to share with you. Let's look at it. For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's Matthew chapter 16 and verse 25. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Sounds like a riddle, doesn't it? But we know that God put that in his word and how much truth there is into that. Well, let's start with the young people, okay? You know, when I was young, some of the things I had to learn. I had to learn, first of all, who I was. When you're real young, your parents tell you who you are and what you're doing, and they make all the decisions for you. But there comes a point and a time when we begin to think for ourselves, don't, don't, don't we? And we begin to see uh, and ask questions. Well, why am I here? What's my purpose? Uh, they ask children sometimes what you're going to be when you grow up. I didn't know for a long time, did you? I, I don't know if I still know, but uh, anyway, we, we think about those things. And I want to share a verse of scripture with you, young people, that I think is so important from Jeremiah 29. 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. That is the word of God to every one of us. He has a plan. You see, I believe that we're not accidents. I believe every one of us are gifted with life. And God created us. Mary Kay Ash said, You are somebody because God doesn't make any junk. We're, we're, you're special in His sight. And when we think about the things that he gives us, he gives us our life. But listen, he gives us all kinds of gifts in our life. He's gifted, and we have a great bunch of young people today. I love that group over there. Uh, six of them were at the house this week, and I told them I was speaking. I said, you're going to be there. They said, we sure are, and they're here tonight, today. I appreciate that so much. They're gifted. They have a lot of talent. And we look at this group, and they have fun in church. I don't know about you, but uh, they just love each other. And there's a lot of camaraderie. There's a lot of love in that group. What a blessing that is. But as we think about that, God has given each one of you something different and something special. You know your DNA is different than anybody else's. Even if you're an identical twin, your DNA is different. God made you different. He gifted you different, and he has a plan for you. That verse says, I know the plans I have for you. And when I was young and I started, I thought I knew, but uh, God has a plan. I have a plan, and the secret to life is finding out and merging those two together. And I often thought when I was young, well, God's going to want me to do something that I don't want to do. Listen, he's giving you the gifts that you need to do the plan that he's given you. You'll be happier, you'll be more fulfilled if you find out what it is that God wants for you. And so as we think about that a minute, we, we find that uh, there are things that get in the way of that. You know, there are things that bother us. When we're young, we don't like to be a a leader, we like to be a follower most of the time, don't we? We don't want to step out front. But listen, sometimes in our life, we have to learn to be leaders. And there are things in our life that will hinder us and destroy us if we're not careful. There's some things you need to stay away from. You need to stay away from drugs. You need to stay away from cigarettes. And I'll tell you why. These people over here that smoke, 
And they will tell you that's the worst decision I ever made. It cost me a lot of money. It cost me $10 a pack. I pay it when I'm young, and when I get old, I quit paying that, and I pay the doctor to help me get my health back. Leave it, all that stuff alone. It's not going to help you. It will, it will hinder you, and when you get old, you try to recover from all those bad habits that you've taken. You don't have to smoke. You don't have to vape. You don't have to do any of that to impress anybody because God made you, and you are who you are. Learn to be yourself. Somebody said be yourself because everybody else is taken. Everybody else is taken. You just be yourself and learn to be comfortable with that. You see, I look at my life, and I'm going to share a few personal things today. It's a hard day for me to do that, but I, I need to do that. I remember when I was, uh, I was moved to Greensboro when I was about 18 or 19. Carol and I went up there. I had started school, and I didn't finish. Went up there, and I uh, got a job, and for a couple of years, it went good. And then I decided I got laid off from that job, a good job, and uh, had no family around. They were a long ways from us. And I needed to find a job. I wanted to go back to school and finish my schooling. And I did do that, but I, I never forget, I was looking in the paper. I had a part-time job. I knew I was going to get laid off, so I had a part-time job. And I found an ad, and it said this, manager trainee in the Greensboro newspaper. And I said, that sounds like me, and the money was good, and I, I went to an office building. And in, uh, there was a desk, just one room. I guess they just rented that. And uh, they said, we're in the food service business. And uh, we, we cater to high-end clients. And they said, you be here at such and such a time in a couple of days. And i never forget, I went to that restaurant. It was a restaurant. But it wasn't an ordinary restaurant. It was a high-class restaurant. It was one like I had never eaten in. In High Point, North Carolina, years ago, they had the furniture market. And they, it was a world furniture market. And people came from everywhere to that for a month in the spring, a month in the fall, and business was good. And this restaurant catered to white-collar workers, men who had expense accounts, men who were traveling. And I went there that day having no idea, but I needed the money. I needed it bad. And I went, and I'll never forget, they showed me in the back, beautiful, beautiful building, and showed me how they age those steaks and uh, introduced me to the kitchen staff. I was to be a manager trainee. I worked that half of a day, three quarters of a day. And then they called me up, and I was to meet with the, the guy in charge, and we sat down at the table, and I got to looking around, and I happened to notice, boy, this was a beautiful building. But over on the right side, there was a bar over there. And it was bigger than this church, much bigger than that. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. They didn't bar any expenses in it. And I looked, and they brought me my lunch. They brought a, a nice steak, one of those aged ones out that was so good. And the waitresses, they had skirts that were halfway from the knees up. All of them had that. They had fish net hose on. They had low-cut tops, and they wore high heels when they served the food. I'll never forget, I was like 22 years old, and I sat there, and I thought about that, and I needed the money bad. And they brought me my food, and I was waiting for the guy to come to finish up the interview and tell me my schedule. And I sat there, and I looked, and I said, my father preached for 50 years. He preached from the time I was a, a baby, and I remember him speaking about alcohol. You know, then that was a thing. He dealt with men who wouldn't work. He dealt with families that did without. He dealt with all kinds of people that had ruined their life because of alcohol. And I looked at that and I said, I know my mom and dad are going to come to support me. And I'm going to be embarrassed when they come. And that's there. And the second thing I said, when I get home, my wife and my two children, I don't need to be in this place. I don't need to be here. And I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, I had no plans. And God, within a few weeks, in fact, that day I told the guy, I said, you owe me for a day's pay. I owe you for a stake. I said, don't even issue a check. I, I, I love you guys, but I'm not going to be back. I'm not going to be back anymore. And I remember within a short period of time, somebody called me that I knew, and they said, you remember you did a little part-time work. We got a job for you. And I, I took that job in sales, one that nobody would want, you know. But God bless me. God bless me. Listen, the first two years later, I graduated from my college, and I never forget, I 
did enough that they paid a full week's expense to Hawaii for me and Carol, and everything was paid for. I said, God had a better plan. God had a better plan. Listen, don't be afraid to be who you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Make up your mind who you're going to be, that you're going to serve the Lord. Stay out of the trouble because it will, it will cause you a lot of problems. Well, what about these that you move up a little bit older? What do you deal with in your life? Well, I'll tell you what you deal with mostly. You deal with, with pressure, and you deal with priorities. You get busy, don't you? You know this kind of a middle age in here? They're the ones, they're the strongest, they're talented, but boy, are they busy. They got children, our children came along, and we got a life, and, and uh, there are things to do. You've got a job, and you're trying to excel in that job. And I don't know about you, but have you... When, when you get to be a parent, have you noticed all your kids, they don't want them cheap tennis shoes anymore? You try to talk a kid into a $20 pair instead of a $150 pair, it's hard. The 12-year-olds seem to win all the time, don't they? Well, there are pressures on us, things that we need to do, that we feel like we need to do. And what a time in our life it is, our job, our career, trying to provide all the things that we need. And Jesus Christ, one time he went up on the mountain, and he met with a group of people, I believe, a lot like that. And as he was there, they were seated, and he began to teach. And he taught them a, a lot of different things. He said, like, love your enemies. He said, pray for them that despitefully use you, and that you might be the children of God. Pretty tough, isn't it? And what he said to them, the most important thing that he said to them, it's in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. For, and, it, and it says this. She's going to put it up there for us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. Can I tell you something you need to learn? You need to learn the priorities of your life. Your priority is not making money. Hopefully you'll make a lot of money. God's not opposed to you making money. He, he created it all. He made it all. He, it's okay if you have something. But listen... Your priorities to love the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, mind, and soul is what we have to do. And the pressures of life get so intense in our life, and it seems like we don't have time to do anything. I tell people every once in a while that I feel like I could be good if I only had one or two things to do. But I got a whole slate full, don't you? I'm a parent, I'm a grandparent, I'm an employer, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, I'm a teacher, I'm a, all these things. And when you put it all together, we find that it's very difficult to do. Listen, Jesus said, make that your priority. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. What does it do? How does it change you? Listen, one of the responsibilities that you have, could you bring me that water I left over there? One of the responsibilities that you have is your family and taking care of your family and leading them. And I, I know that one of the problems, thank you, one of the problems that we have in that is, is just feeling inadequate and the pressures and the times. Listen, I, I read a statistic the other day. It is frightening. It is absolutely frightening. If you're, if you're a lady and you're bringing your children up and you're the only one that goes to church and you love the Lord and you come and you bring your children, to try to bring your children, try to raise them up, 13% of those become a Christian and get involved in church and are faithful to the Word of God. But when the man, when the man joins in that and he's faithful and he comes and he dedicates himself and he loves the Lord, 93% of those children come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and accept the same thing. Listen, men, it's a responsibility that we have. It's the most important thing. If you, Jesus said, if you're getting the whole world and lose your soul, what do you have? You don't have anything. I like to think about it this way. God gives us a lot of things that money can buy, but he gives us some things that money can't buy. Save children are one of those things that he can give you. I, I love the Bible because it helps us to grow, and I 
watched in my Sunday school class over the years, guys would come into the class. Sometimes they're big and strong, and they're just brunt, and, and you know, they just say what they think. They, they're the kind, they're an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. You don't bother me, and I don't bother you. You know what I'm talking about. And I watch over a period of time of the teachings of Jesus Christ. He begins to melt that heart, and he begins to give them a gentle spirit. He teaches them, listen, you're still strong. You still have all those things, but you can communicate with your wife. You can talk to your children in a way where they'll understand you. And listen, boys, you can talk to them about it anyway. Girls will pucker up and cry on you, won't they? You better learn to be gentle. And God will change our life and give us the ability to be the parents that we ought to be. But listen, it's a decision. It's a decision that I'm going to seek the kingdom of God first. I love the fact he adds that in there. Uh, All the rest I'll add unto you. Get your priorities right. God wants to bless you. I don't know about you, but it's hard to bless a disobedient child, isn't it? It's hard to pour your blessings and good gifts on them when they're not where they need to be. Well, seniors, you finally made it, didn't you? You got there, and you got some age on you like I do. And uh, I, I, I love grandparents. Grandparents and being a grandfather is one of the greatest blessings that I've ever had. Making mistakes with my children, and I made plenty. I had to apologize many times. I apologize today to my children for the mistakes and the ignorance that I had sometimes in bringing them up. But I love them, and I love my grandchildren. I'm a little bit smarter. And now I have two great-grandchildren. And I remember that... uh, God has given us some things, seniors. Listen, one of the things I love, Philippians 1, verse 6, he says, being very confident of this, he who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? He saved you, he began something, you made a commitment to him, and he's going to be with you from now on. It doesn't matter whether you're old, it don't matter if you forget who you are, it doesn't matter any of those things. Jesus is going to continue, and you're going to be his, and he's going to be faithful to you until the day that you leave. Now, i got to tell you that sometimes people, when they get old, they think that they can't be productive for the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, you're smarter now than you've ever been. You have more influence than you've ever had. You've learned by the mistakes that you've made in life, and I've made plenty of them. Listen, it's much easier to learn from somebody else's experience than have to experience it all and learn it the hard way, isn't it? And grandparents, what a great role that you play in the family. There's some TV shows that have been on in the past. I, I watch the Waltons. You probably watched them when you grew up. And I saw grandma and grandpa in the family. And what a role that they played. Sometimes parents have to be disciplinarians. And you have children that you have to just rein in a little bit. But listen, grandparents can just love them, can't you? They can just love them. And I, I sometimes we see the disparity between what the parents are trying to do and what's getting done. And sometimes we just have a chance to step in there and just to make a difference in their life. I loved my grandfather. My grandfather died when I was 12 years old. And I never remember my grandfather giving me but one gift in my whole life. He gave me a silver dollar when I was like 12 years old, the year before he died. But he gave me so much, so much. Listen, he taught me how to work. And one of the ways I remember, we used to go out and he'd get him, pick me up. I just loved. When he came in, I knew he was coming to get me. My sister was too young. My brother and my other sister were too old. They were doing something. He came to get me. And he taught me how to mow the grass. He taught me how to pick blackberries. It was funny. We'd go and he knew somebody that would buy them. And we would pick. I would pick about this many and he'd pick about that many. And he'd put it all in a gallon, and we'd sell a gallon of blackberries for a dollar, and he would give me the money. He wouldn't give me money, just giving me money. But he taught me how to work. We would go, and he would, he mowed a cemetery, one of, that he was buried in, actually, now. And he would come and get me. He was disabled to a degree. And he would come get me, and we'd go, and we would mow that. He wouldn't pay me for that. But he'd take me fishing every time we did. He'd take me down behind a dam that I just love going down there and watching the water and fish. He would take me swimming. 
Listen, sometimes we try to buy love from our kids. We try to give them all the things, and we ruin them and spoil them, and we lose the ethic of work. Don't forget that. And grandparents, so many times you can step in and you can make a difference in their life. Well, get to the tough part now. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says this, As it is written, I have not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. Listen, we're going to leave here one day. And when we leave here, we've got somewhere to go. You see, I don't know about you. I think most of you older ones are like me. I don't want to go back over there. I don't want to be young again. I don't want to go back over there in that middle age. I'm just fine where I am. And as I get older, I find that there's a lot more up there for me than there is here. I've got a mother. I've got a father. I've got a brother. I've got things. And listen, my body is wearing out. I can tell. I can tell my life is slowing down. And I don't have the things to do. But listen, I don't want to go back to that. I have something better. And Jesus Christ promised us that. And what a blessing it is. The other day, Sam was at the table and she and... Carol and I were talking, and she happened to ask me about some of the people that had been in our life some time ago. And uh, when we talk about plans, I remember my father asked me one time. My father preached, and uh, he asked me one day when I was a young man, he said, "Uh, Jack, do you feel like the Lord is asking you or calling you to preach? And I thought about that for a little while, and I said, no, Dad, I, I really don't. And I knew he was wanting, hoping that I would. But I never felt the call to pastor a church. But I love to teach. I love to share. And the life that God chose for us was so much different, folks. Listen, uh, got to pray for me here, okay? Uh, What God gave us, that job that God gave us, he gave me all the tools that I needed for the things that he called me to do. You see, I'm not scared to stand up here and talk to you not that way one time. It took a lot of years of getting where I was not scared to death, and my mind would work a little bit. It don't work real good, but where it would work at least some where I could get it out. God prepared me. When Carol was 40 years old, she decided she needed to go back to nursing school, and she went back and got her RN, and uh, let me just tell you what God did for us and how and I, I didn't even realize it through all the times until we, we kind of played a wonderful life. I did the other night. Sam started talking about those things, and I'm like, Jimmy Stewart, well, what, what has God done with my life? What has he done? And, and we were just reminiscing. Can I tell you, there were 27 people who lived in our household besides my children in the last 50 years or so since we've been married. 27 people. Can I tell you about a few of them? First of all, There were three babies that came home from the hospital, and they were brand-new babies. We were in our early 20s, and we kept those babies for for an adoption agency until they were placed, until the time expired. Three children. Boy, it changed our life. You see what happened to me when I was in college. There was an abortionist who came to the school, and they gave us extra credit to go down there and listen to him It was in the early 70s when Roe v. Wade finally passed, and they were sending out people. They were building abortion clinics all across the nation, and they were sending people out. This was a doctor. He was an abortionist. That's what he did for a living, and he walked into the assembly, and I was there, and he began to tell about abortions, and he began to tell, and people began to ask questions, and I'll never forget then. He began to tell how an abortion took place. You know, the kids wanted to know, everybody wanted to know, and they inserted a salt saline solution into a woman that was pregnant. It induced labor, and that baby was born, and because of the salt and the things, it would just burn up. Most of them were dead when they were delivered. And, and I never forget, people began to ask, well, what do you do if they're, uh, if they're born alive? What do you do? He said, we don't do anything. We're not there to save that baby. We're there to terminate the pregnancy. That's what we're at. i never forget, I listened to that that day. I walked out of that door, and I was sick on my stomach. I was sick. I, I, just, I was just nauseated, thinking a human race like us, intelligent people could do, and be so barbaric 
We just lower the standard of living for every one of us. Listen, our value decreases when we do that. God made every one of us special, and we have something. And God just burdened my heart, and that's where those three babies came from. We kept a 10-year-old. Her mother got in all kinds of trouble. And that 10-year-old, we went and took foster classes, and we spent a period of time keeping that child. We had three unwed pregnant mothers to live in our home that we opened up our home to to live for a while. We had her grandmother that lived in our house till she died. Carol's hospice care came in good. She lived there several years. My mother lived there five or six years. She had, she had dementia, and we took care of her. God just, God just blessed us and gave us the ability and the desire, and he gave us the gifts that we needed to do that. He gave them to Carol, and he gave me the desire. That day when I heard that abortionist speak, it changed my life. If you're in my Sunday school class, you know it changed my teaching because I value life. I value every human being because I believe God created us, and he made us, and he gave us a plan and a purpose for our life. Listen, all those people came, but i got to tell you one story. Uh, I wouldn't tell this story for years, but I need to tell it today. There's a young lady that came. I don't want to call her name. But she came and she had, Carol had gone to the Pregnancy Resource Center. She started counseling there. I remember after several years, she uh, kept a diary of how many ladies came in to have an abortion and then how many that uh, decided to give birth to that child. The last count she had was 37. She lost her diary and we don't know how many. But I remember this one girl, she came. And she came in, uh, she came to the Pregnancy Resource Center and that's where Carol met her. And she was troubled. She had a history of drugs. She had three children. She was in a bad marriage, and she was uh, using drugs. And by the way, folks, she started, you know how she started? Like everybody started, recreational. Recreational drugs. It's killing our society. It's killing our young people. Listen, folks, it is an epidemic. And that's how she started, and that's how everybody starts, isn't it? You don't intend to go out there and take a drug and be homeless out here on the street. You don't intend to do that, but that's what happens to you. And this girl, she was so troubled. Uh, Carol counseled her. She, was, she had those three children. She had had one abortion. Carol uh, talked her into giving birth. The one was adopted after that. She had another one when she was out in, in her drugs and uh, she had a venereal disease. She went to the hospital and she gave birth to another one. The social services came in and took that child. And she lived with us for a period of time. She, would, she had a good heart. Listen, she wanted to. She tried to quit. She just couldn't. She stayed with us for a while and she'd get better and then worse and then get better. And finally, we parted and she went to Alabama to live. And she'd call every now and then and she'd say, uh, I'm doing good. I'm doing real good. I haven't used. I'm doing good. And then one day, about uh, several years later, we got a phone call. It was her stepmother. And she said uh, she did good for a while, but she had her, damaged her heart because of uh, all the drug use. And she was taking heart medication, and she went out one more time, one more time, and it killed her. It killed her. We got that news, and I thought about the gifts that she's given. Listen, you think that's the end of the story, but that's not the end of the story. That is not the end of the story. Can you put that verse up on there in Ecclesiastes? It's not the end of the story. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Solomon, the wisest man in the world, wrote, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of the man. And then the next verse, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. One day, God is going to judge us. And what is he going to judge us for? Listen, I said a while ago, God has gifted you. He's given you things that he's not given anybody else. You have skills and ability. And if you have come to Christ, he's given you spiritual gifts that you can use. You can use it on your job. You can use it in church. You can use it in your community. And what he has given you is your gift to him. And one day you'll stand before him and you know what? We give an account for those gifts that he gives to us. That's what that verse said. He's going to look at us and he's going to say, here's what I gave you. What do you have left to give me with what I gave you? And the sad part is most people are going to stand there empty-handed and have absolutely nothing for Jesus Christ. 
Listen, folks, the job of the church, you come and worship. You come and praise the Lord. You come and learn. But listen, the job of the church is not in here. It's not in here. It's in your everyday life. It's involving in the children. It's involving in the people in your community. Maybe it's your children. When we were, our kids were growing up, I didn't really like for going to go spend the night everywhere else. Bring them here. Bring them to our house. Let them spend the night here. Get involved in the things that are going on. God will speak to your heart about what you need to do. He's gifted you already. He's prepared you already. You have what you need to do God's will. Listen, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. I look out and I see kids with backpacks. They're sleeping in the woods. They're high all the time in the daytime. It's terrible. Joseph deals with them. Uh, Josh deals with them every day, every day. Lives that are just wasted and gone. In the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to stand up. Listen, if you thought I was going to come here and tell you if you were old to sit down and do nothing, I am not. But my dad had a good saying. He said, I don't wanna, I'm going to wear out. I don't want to rust out. I'm going to wear out, but I'm not going to rust out. Listen, there's so much to do. I'm going to ask you to do something today. Young people. If, if you want to follow the plans that God has for you, listen, it makes adjustments in your life. You have to make adjustments to do what he wants. Sometimes it's understanding, you read and you study, and it's putting that idea aside for something better. Listen, God had something a lot better for me than that first job that I might have taken. He had something better for me. I'm going to ask you to do something. The pastor's going to come in a minute. I'm going to ask you to stand here. And if that's what you want for your life, you want... And you've been under the influence of your parents most of your life. And you're probably here today because your parents brought you here today. And you had to be here today. There comes a time when you have to say, I want to be here. This is what I want to do. I want the will of God and I want his plans in my life for me. That's what I want. Listen, I'm going to ask you to come and shake the preacher's hand today and go back. He needs to be encouraged. Middle-aged people, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. If the priorities of your life are not right, you need to get them right. Listen, men, you need to be the first one to step out. Your wife needs to see that you're committed to Christ. Your children and your grandchildren need to see that it's important to you because if it's not important to you, it's not going to be important to them. It will not be. So you need to step out and encourage the pastor and encourage your family. And seniors, if you're, uh, if you're here and you, you're, you're like me. I just don't want to give up. I made a mess of things sometimes. I, I am not one to stand here. Uh, I have made so many mistakes in my life. And, and God, thank goodness for his grace and his mercy that he can forgive us and he, we can start over with him. But you're, you're, you're just going to keep on keeping on. You've been faithful to God. You come and you shake the pastor's hand. Pastor, come on up here. Danny, would you come and play? And there's one group I haven't talked about yet. There's one group I haven't said anything about, and that's those of you who have not given your heart and life to Jesus Christ. There's some of you that haven't committed your life. You see, you're still in charge of your life. You've not given Jesus the charge of your life. You don't want to follow him because you're afraid that he's going to ask you to do something, and you might have to give up something, and you want control of your life. That is our biggest battle in our life, isn't it? We want control. We don't want to give it up. Jesus said, if you'll lose your life, you'll find it. You'll find a much better one that he has for you than you have for yourself. That's the riddle. That's a fallacy of all of it, is our thinking is all wrong. Listen, if you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to come. I'm going to be up here on the stage. I'm going to ask you to do something. You just come up here and you stand. You need to be saved and you need to ask Christ to come in your heart and commit your life to him. And you need to be baptized. You need to be a follower of Jesus Christ. What baptism is, it's a public announcement that, yes, I'm following Jesus. I'm not going to be a follower anymore. I want to be a leader in the group that I'm in, in the young people that I'm in, my peers. Young people, listen, it doesn't matter what anybody else does, but it does matter what you do. It matters what you do because Christ is calling you and he's asking you. Would you stand and let's have a prayer. And, and when we start, when we finish a prayer, don't waste any time. If you want to shake his hand, and by saying that, that's what I want for my life. I want, to be, I want my priorities to be right. I want my plans to be right. And I want to finish well, seniors, is what I want to do. 
Lord, thank you for being here today. And thank you for just the things that you've done in my life. And Lord, the things that you give us that money can't buy. Lord, we wouldn't trade those for anything in the world. I pray that you'll speak to hearts today. Lord, I believe there's somebody that needs to give their heart and life and begin the new walk in their life with Jesus Christ. Help them to have the courage today to come and make that decision for you. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.